live from New York City. <laughs> it is Elise to tell you about financial literacy. Woo-hoo. And Jamie has laughed. Oh no. There's <laughs> nothing I can do. <laughs> <laughs> nothing that can be done in this situation. Oh, well. Yeah, we can use this chat. <laughs> Ross is back. That's good. This chat's always good. Oh, perfect. Everyone good? Everyone's mic is muted? Besides mine and Laura's, obviously. Yes, yeah. So, obviously, we're going to start with a little icebreaker. Yeah. I apologize for the background noise because there's a street behind me. So I'm at a little park. So <laughs> I hear some truck noises every now and again. Don't be alarmed. It's just New York City. Also, you might hear pigeon noises too. It's just New York City. All right, Larry, you can start the icebergs. I've done talking about New York. Great. Are you okay, really in New York? So, just <laughs> for York, anybody yes. um, that ends up tuning into this that isn't in our math class. This is going to be a webinar on financial liter- literacy for the junior intermediate context and specifically for using it in math, but also any cross-curricular applications. So uh, we have an icebreaker for you. Um, we decided to make it very uh, focused on current events. Um, and it is designed in a way that it could be used. You can use it in a classroom if you want. I think probably grade seven or eight would probably be good um, based on the subject matter that we're going to be addressing in the icebreaker. And um, also it deals with a news topic that they probably would have heard of at some point, uh, either through their parents or on the internet or watching TV. So if you could get to the icebreaker, um, has everyone had a chance to look at any of the articles we'll be reading. Did you read them ahead of time or are you going to read them now? Did anyone look at them ahead of time or are we looking at them right now? Briefly, Not read them? But, okay, yeah. great. So um, you have a choice between one of two articles. Uh, if you're a fast reader, you can read both of them, but that is in no way required. It just would give you some extra context for the discussion we're going to have uh, following the reading of the articles. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the beautiful image we have of who will probably be the next president of the United States. So everyone, when you're finished skimming over one or both of the articles, let me know. Um, and uh, I'll open the floor for a couple discussion questions and reactions to the article from there. So just so that there's not too much dead air as we're looking through, um, the first thing I'll want somebody to do, just in case somebody's watching this webinar that didn't get a chance to read one of the articles, is if you could very briefly, just maybe in one or two sentences, summarize what the main idea of the article was, uh, what your main takeaway from the article was. 
it's Donald Trump. <laughs> Main takeaway is the rich are obsessed with getting richer for some reason. But <laughs> Donald Trump's concerned about his four billion uh, net worth not being thirteen billion. Okay, so that's great. There's a worry about or a discussion on uh, Donald Trump's net worth, um, whether it's possible that he could, um, if he had made different choices with his money, if he could have had more money. Um, yeah, what in particular were, was the article or articles talking about um, what's something that Trump could have done that may have uh, increased his net worth, worth now. He's talking about if he had invested in index funds, it would yes. have been a better uh, way to go for him. Yeah, and in investing in index funds, is there any sort of, do you just invest in them and then you, do you have to keep on doing something or is it more you put the money there, you monitor it and you don't necessarily have to do much work beyond that? So you just invest in it and leave it. Okay. Um, it's really, that's all you have to do. <laughs> um, so very different from running a business, but it's still very important uh, for his uh, finances. So... Mm. Makes um, you want to go invest in index funds. Yeah, no, we all have to invest in index funds. It's my takeaway from that. <laughs> um, but... Uh, Ross has a quick question. Oh, sorry. Ross doesn't know what an index fund is. And Great. Maybe don't okay. that. That's okay. I don't know what it is either, guys. Don't worry. Okay, so, well, an index fund is essentially um, an average of several different stocks all grouped together. So if you're thinking about mean, median, and low, it's oh, you, take, okay. or you take, say, 30 stocks, divide them, um, and it ends up being, that's the price of the fund. So in, I'm just going to quote directly from one of the articles. It says, what is an index fund? So since the late 1800s, companies like Standard & Poor's and Dow Jones um, have calculated and published averages of groups of stock prices. So it's the prices of stocks added up and uh, divided. So you're basically, instead of just, let's say that you are just investing in a single company, say Apple, um, an index fund is a bundle of many different companies and many different groups. So if one company in it isn't doing so well, it doesn't really um, affect your investments as much because it's covered by, you know, if there's 30 different companies, mm -hmm. there, odds are there's more companies that are going to be doing well out of the 30. Mm -hmm. So, um, what was something, reading that, what was something that surprised you about the article? Or something that you found interesting about the article? Oh, and yes, good point, at least. It's okay to not know things in math class. I know, there's a lot of things I don't know in math class, so I'm willing to learn just as much as everyone else. I think, I think what shocked me the most is that um, Donald Trump's net worth went up 300%. That's, mm -hmm. that's huge. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Since 1987. So how yeah. Long has that been now? Yeah, that's crazy. Oh. That's good because it's like a 20 or something year, whatever, like gap, like... If we're, if we're looking forward, each of us presumably has more than that amount of time left in our lifetime, right? So we want to increase our network by 300%. We can look at investing into uh, index funds when we get to the point of investing. Oh, yeah, for sure. We're just mm -hmm. investing in general, right? It's better than um, just leaving your 
in an extreme example of leaving your money in a shoebox under your bed or in a more realistic example, maybe just leaving it in a bank account and you don't really know what to do with it. It's better to start putting it in a savings fund or putting it um, in investments. What's what's interesting, it kind of sometimes sometimes it's scary to me. Like all of my money, we've put into our house, right? And so if we sell our house, we we get a good chunk of money back. But if the housing yeah. market ever plummeted, we would lose our entire savings and investment at that point because we just every everything we have, we just put into the mortgage, paying it down. Right? Yeah. Um, so that might spark an interesting conversation uh, in a classroom too. Like where where would you put your money? Right? Like what you have? Let's say you have a hundred thousand dollars. That's pretty realistic these days. What do you do with it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there are a couple more questions, but we started a bit late, so I want to sort of move into the bulk of um, webinar. Sounds good. This is sort of the, the point of this and why you might use this in a classroom would be um, you could start it as part of a larger inquiry project mm -hmm. if students are wondering, well, why would investments like, why would Donald Trump be richer if he had invested in index funds? I don't get that. Well, that's something that you can investigate. That's something I think that's mm -hmm. worth investigating even for just the average Canadian, right? That's um, true. Exactly. And it's also, uh, it can be used to think about averages, mean, median, mode, compound interest, any sort of just introduction into here is how financial literacy plays out outside the classroom. <laughs> And on a large scale, it can have a big difference. Uh oh, what happened there? Uh oh, this can be, uh -oh. Can be oh. dramatic. Yeah. There she goes. Sorry, Larry, you just cut off for like a brief second. We all panicked. <laughs> <laughs> One of those days. Exactly. Oh, I like that point, Jamie. Made. As an extension, could be to research someone else who invested their money and see what their worth is now. Yeah, that'd be sure a really good idea. idea. Yeah, that'd be especially to see like millionaires like JK Rowling, for example, who has yes. invested so much money to charity that she's not a billionaire anymore. Yeah. So it would be mm -hmm. different to like compare and contrast the different. So I'm going to start. This was a great discussion, guys. I'm going to start into our introduction and talk to you guys all about financial literacy from the financial district in New York City. That's fantastic. So, I try. I try. I try to get my setting location. You, you so went good. far for this course. I oh my gosh. Just for the, the, the effect of the webinar, you went to A plus. plus. Book Nicely this vacation done. for this purpose. So <laughs> the purpose of today's webinar, guys, is to basically help you guys understand what financial literacy is and how important it is to integrate it into the Ontario curriculum as we need to help our students become aware of smart money-making decisions and provide them with the necessary critical lifelong financial skills. So we're basically gonna go over what it is, why it's important, how to include it into your curriculum, some examples, some resources as well, because resources, we love the resources, especially the free ones, and also links to gather more information on the topic. So four questions you're gonna probably consider during this webinar is what is financial literacy and why is it important for me to integrate it alongside my curriculum? How do I include it into the curriculum? Do I only include it in math class? Can I include it in the other subjects? When should I start teaching financial literacy to my students? And what are some important lifelong skills that my students are going to learn by introducing this topic? So to start, I'm gonna give you a brief overview on what financial literacy is. So the Ontario Ministry of Education basically defines it as the means of having the knowledge and skills to make responsible economic and financial decisions with confidence. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have the confidence to make big, big, big financial decisions. I don't know how Laura just got a car. That's scary to me. <laughs> and I'm gonna have to do that one day. So it's a good thing I'm teaching you guys about financial literacy so we can all gain confidence in our financial skills. So although there's no official course offered in our schools, financial literacy is a subject that can be integrated into any existing Ontario curriculum. You can start it off in grade four, where you can include this additional instructional lens to help your students understand how to make informed financial decisions and build essential skills to help prepare them for the future. I'm also gonna shoo this fly away because it wants to learn about financial literacy too, but can't, buddy, sorry. So why should we teach it? Well, 
young people these days are starting to need a wide range of skills and knowledge to make informed money decisions more than ever. By the time students are 19 years old, about half of these teens are already joined the labor force and they're already working part time. They're thinking about university, they're thinking about college, they're thinking about possibly getting a house going through OSAB, they're thinking of so many things right now, but they don't have the necessary skills to make those decisions. And many youth as well, they don't really have access to the types of resources because either they don't know about them or they're so unmotivated or unclear about the relevance of financial literacy that they don't see any value of it in their lives. So we need our students to understand basic money management skills as they'll need to eventually make those giant financial decisions in the future. They're going to be like Laura. They're going to have to go out and buy a car or they're going to be like David and buy their house. They're going to make those big decisions and then they're not going to know what to do when they're making those decisions. So we need to do that and we need to fix it. So how are we going to integrate this giant thing with all these pigeons fly over me? into this very, very, very tiny little classroom that we're all going to have. Well, the good thing about financial literacy is that it can be incorporated into any subject, not just math, guys, so we don't have to stress about that. So any subject in the Ontario curriculum, it's not solely a math-based subject, and it can actually be included in all other subjects like the arts, science, language, etc. The subject financial literacy is integrated in a way that can teach one of the following essential skills. It can either teach one, important skills that can develop financial literacy skills, such as problem solving, critical thinking, and decision making. Or two, it can help students make connections to learn about their place in the world as a responsible and compassionate citizen, or when they study different economic systems like social studies, the science, the arts, and language. So on the handout as well too, I gave some examples on how you can incorporate it into your math class. So just to briefly go over it as well too, on what you can include. For the junior grades, you mostly start focusing about bartering money, earning and spending, income saving, resources and banking concepts. By intermediate grade, they should probably know stuff like about profit and loss, trade-offs, markets, entrepreneurship, imports and exports, especially in geography class, for example budgets, credit and debit, supply and demand, sorted and surplus, competition, and exchange rates. And I also included high school as well too, because even though we are a junior intermediate, you never know when you might be teaching a grade nine or 10 class. So like I said, on the handout as well, there are some examples of financial literacy topics in math class. So I'll just briefly go over two. So in the junior grades, you could talk about how to save money for a big purchase that you want to buy even if it's not so large though let's say like maybe you want to buy I don't know a coloring book for your best friend you could teach the grade four is like how much you're gonna save to get a coloring book for your best friend's birthday well in the intermediate grades you can explain how your decisions on what you buy can impact you your family and your community and Canada and even the world some pretty scary stuff so now we're going to switch over to Laura because Laura's going to go over a financial literacy example now. And we're going to get you guys to do some problem solving. So get your thinking caps on. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Thanks, Elise. That was really great. Good summary of some very important points on financial literacy. Okay. So the uh, activity that we've planned here, the intended grade level is grade seven, um, but you could scale it up or down. Uh, depending on the complexity, how complex you make the questions and the different details that you have to pay attention to. So the task is called party time because this week it's both Elise and my birthday. Elise was on Monday and I am tomorrow. So um, our birthday is coming up and you decide to throw a surprise party for us with the help of three other friends. With a $30 budget in mind, you have to plan out the menu the entertainment, and decorations for this special day. So there's a couple uh, requirements for the party, what you're going to do with that $30 budget. Two snacks and two drinks, three decorations of any sort, uh, and one board game so that your party members don't get bored standing around. Uh, so to get you started, we have some grocery flyers from Red Flag Deals. 
and uh, some of the questions to focus on is how can you make sure your friends are having a good time while staying on budget? Uh, what are some of the things you need for a fun party? And what sort of snacks would you want to have keeping in mind different people's tastes or dietary restrictions or preferences? And also remember to uh, keep in mind that the tax is 13% for all of your purchases. So we can start brainstorming in the chat or you can do it in a separate Google Doc. Um, <laughs> yes, the inner Jamie thinking about tax. Uh, so yeah, we can start brainstorming here in the chat, um, whatever you prefer to think about the $30 budget. That's a super great point, Ross. You guys want to see the chat real quick? Ross just mentioned like fun lesson. They could even budget an end of the year party and fundraise it. That'd be amazing. Yeah. 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 It's such a good idea, right? <laughs> even Shanice agrees. <laughs> yeah, th thinking about uh, planning a party is something that I think your students could get really uh, excited about uh, because every everyone loves parties, not just kids. Um, and it's also something that's practical. Uh, most of the students will probably celebrate birthday parties, depending on their religion. Um, but a lot of them will or have some sort of celebration at some point in their life. So being able to figure out, OK, what, what do you have to think about when you're planning a party? Uh, how much money do I have at my disposal? That's something that's really important. Um, if you were scaling it up a grade, you could have, we gave a very mod modest budget, $30, but if you were going up to upper grades, you could start thinking about, oh, you're planning prom or you're planning homecoming. You've got to rent a banquet hall. You've got to think about catering. Uh, if your students wanted to go in that direction and wanted to make it really big. So David just mentioned in the Hangout chat, basically we can spend about twenty six ten maximum before tax. So if that gives you guys a little bit of help as well too to plan out the party, everybody, big shout out to David for calculating that for us. Yeah, thanks. Good collaboration, guys. Yeah, fruit for snacks is a great idea. It's healthy and delicious. As long as you can dip it in chocolate. chocolate fondue that could double as a party activity and a snack. <laughs> So David's saying ten to twelve dollars for fruit and chocolate. Vanessa says cheese is on sale for two ninety nine at Value Mart. Cheese is also a popular party snack. Yeah, dollar store is key. There's a lot of really uh, 
fun stuff at the dollar store, especially around Halloween. I get lost in there at this time of year. Oh, cheesies. Okay. I thought when it was cheese with a Z, it was like a cheese type product, not, not a real. <laughs> Yeah, Lindsay, that's a good point. So uh, looking at the flyer options, you're probably, go, given the budget, going to rule out the grocery stores that are typically more expensive because you won't be able to get as much for your dollar. This has been some great brainstorming. Do you think we could approximate how much money we've spent? Just estimate, it doesn't have to be exact, given our time frame. Good, Jamie. Go to Dollar Tree or Dollar M and spend three dollars on decorations. Yeah. Well, I think you said Dollar Tree last time when I mentioned I Dollar M. <laughs> Dollar Tree is the best. It has everything. <laughs> so I go for like everything. <laughs> it's actually a dollar. Well, they're always like a dollar twenty-five everywhere. Not like Dollar M where it can be like, oh, a dollar twenty-five here. Surprise, three dollars. <laughs> Surprise, three dollars. <laughs> Yeah, they have three dollar items now. They do. Yeah. Like what? So I think two more minutes, guys. Dollar Dollar Man had my first four dollar item there last week with the kids. <laughs> I was like four dollars. Come on. <laughs> four dollars. What was it? It was four dollars. It's like a ninja suit or something. It wasn't even that amazing. It was just like this plastic ninja oh sword and like a little headgear or something. I don't know. It wasn't four dollar worthy to be honest for how long it's gonna last them. If it survives out of the car, I'm lucky. Oh, uh, we definitely have to get guess who. Guess who's a fun game. Where it's like Yeah, hey, you like the flip you flip okay. the thing down. And then we're still within the thirty dollars. Yeah. What do we want to drink for drinks? Trade you know, plus invention so they can just have tap water. <laughs> yeah, everyone's usually happy with tap water. Spend a buck and get party cups. You can get you can get those cans of frozen juice for ninety nine cents from somewhere I just looked. That's yeah, true. get some stuff from Concentrate. That's easy. You can just put water in it and make your own, and it's not pop, so it doesn't have that much sugar, and they won't be super hyper, or we won't be super yeah. hyper. <laughs> yeah, we won't be super hyper. Chip party. <laughs> What was that? I don't know. That wasn't me. What, was there a crashing sound? Yeah. Yeah, it was somebody throwing garbage in the dumpster. Oh! Um, oh. Because <laughs> it's, it's situated in such a way that people, um, like, just toss it in. So it makes this rather loud noise. That makes sense. That's a really good point, Lindsay. So to stay within budget, we're talking about making unhealthy food choices. So that is actually a very good segue into... That is a very good segue. Some of the, yeah, it's perfect. Uh, some of the questions that we had uh, related to cross-curricular and extension. So one of our cross-curricular uh, questions were, can you create a menu that follows the Canada Food Guide? Mm. And given the budget, maybe that could be a discussion about why or why not, mm. why that's difficult. Um, that's true. It, it also relates to um, 
I ha we had a question here. Is there anything you found particularly engaging or frustrating about the activity? So something that could be frustrating is that, yeah, you can't, you're pretty limited in your choices and maybe you, maybe you do want fruit and what maybe you want, I don't know, cheese and crackers or something like that. And, you know, you can't necessarily do that on the budget. You've got to stick to chips and pop. So I, I that listen, listen to a study to conversation on privilege and um, access to resources and things that you could connect to social studies, health, um, social justice issues for language arts. And anywhere you want to go with that, you, you're fairly open. Um, we also had an extension activity of can you create a budget if one of the friends is either A, Apollo vegetarian, so only eats chicken, uh, B, is Jewish and so would keep kosher, or C, is allergic to nuts and is mildly lactose intolerant, so can have a bit of dairy, but uh, too much dairy would not be good for that person. So sort of factoring in these real life things of yes, people have dietary restrictions based on for health re reasons, religious reasons, ethical reasons. And uh, how do you accommodate that um, <laughs> mildly lactose intolerant? Um, so uh, we were wondering if this were to be a three part lesson plan. Uh, what would be the minds on consolidation or the assessment tool for uh, for something like this for the planning, the party, and the budget? Yeah, that's a good point. So Jamie's saying that in the instructional lens portion, if you were to put this into our Brock template lesson plan, um, keeping in mind uh, food sensitivities or uh, trying to be inclusive. Um, in your events, that's an instructional lens to. I was look thinking at. too about how you mentioned the religious aspect. Yeah. Be mindful of that. Yeah, that's very important. <laughs> they can and that could be a field trip, though. Yeah. You would get a permission form and make sure the parents are okay with it, Elise. <laughs> Um, so how, how would you, just theoretically, how would you assess this if they were planning a party and they had a budget and the students had to, like, how would you want them to show their knowledge and show their party planning? Uh, maybe cut out sections of the flyers uh, to show what items and where Collage. they're getting them from. Yeah, yeah. And then they, they can also show their work on calculating the tax for those specific items. A written party proposal? Yeah, so like um, events planning? You could have them doing like, um, like a, creating a chart as well to hold all the information that would meet different uh, mathematic requirements as well for the curriculum. They have to tabulate results and things um, for data for data management. Yeah, that's there's a lot of data management that can go um, that can connect to financial literacy in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, especially in terms of displaying the data you've collected about money, about budgeting, investing, uh, whatever it might be. Yeah, the brainstorm yeah. of things they need to consider. I think that's Anessa, I think that's really good because I feel like um, if you were to show that to a principal or to a parent, it would definitely show the students' thinking processes yeah. really effectively because it would show all the different stages as opposed to just maybe a polished end product. So you could see sort of, oh, this is how the student is approaching the problem that's that's been presented to him or her. Yep. 
Oh, Jamie, I really like that. Give different groups different budgets to show to to introduce that privilege conversation. So yeah, it's probably a lot easier to have a good party if you've got maybe a hundred dollars to spare as opposed to just thirty or fifteen dollars. Yes, that's the thing. Yeah, integrating the curriculum is definitely something that is important with financial literacy to really drive the students that it's got real life applications and it's very it does. for the practical uh, aspects of their life. I mean, so many times students will ask, well, why are we learning this or how does this connect to me? Well, this directly connects to you. No matter what career you go into, no matter what's your favorite subject or what's your background, well, well we spend money. So we've got to know exactly. with it. And that kind of so, even segues yeah. to like talking about financial literacy and the other subjects as well too because we mentioned yeah. health and physical education the whole healthy living thing but mm -hmm. something you could also do for financial literacy you could talk about the impact of alcohol abuse on both health and finances you could also talk about smoking as well too and on health and finances yeah. if you smoke it's very expensive it's very expensive <laughs> And just like teaching kids that. That's a great Sorry if anyone way to smokes deter. in here as well too. I apologize if anyone does smoke in here, but it is something that we can teach our kids as well too. We can yeah, also. Yeah, I mean it's a good, it's a good yeah. deterrent, right? Because it's like, well, it's how much you, you gonna spend? Yeah, like, well, don't you want to spend that on something else? Probably. Like, yeah, and in grade like, seven, what are they, we're what talking about all of this stuff. To grade five to seven. Yeah. <laughs> Marijuana. We could also. Um, oh yeah, I was I was gonna talk about the arts. Yeah, um, that's what I was and how students could consider its relationship between the arts. So, arts, community, and media, um, ideas and themes related to socioeconomic issues. The arts could also be used as assessment tools. So, if you're doing um, a drama scene about something to do with financial literacy. Um, it's, it's also kind of important to, if any of your students are really interested in the visual arts or in becoming a professional artist, um, there's a lot that you can do in terms of small business and money management and selling your art. Uh, one, one of my clients that I proofread for, she's a financial planner and a professional artist, and she talks about that a lot. Um, like, she works for artists and how, you know, there's a lot of things you have to consider if you're trying to make a living doing art, you've got to think about the materials you're going to use because when you're selling that art piece, you want people to buy it, but you also don't want to have gone into the red because of the materials you had to buy to create it. All yeah. those factors, right? Yeah. Exactly. And saving money where you're getting your supplies from. I think we're pretty much good to wrap supplies. up, unless there's anything else you want to add, add Laura? Um, no, we kind of touched on how you could connect financial literacy to social studies in terms of global inequality. Exactly. And I'm sure David exactly. knows it so well as well, too, because I'm pretty sure David did something like that in the social studies unit that he made. Also, shout out to this oh, dog nice. that's barking for no reason. He's a chill dog. I'm talking. We also mentioned on the handout as well, too, some other resources. So we gave you guys links. Probably like the best links from the Ontario Ministry of Education just to you know help you out if you need any more financial literacy tips. I also provided some children's books because I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty sure everyone loves a picture book. Picture books can show you so many different things. And these books right here, they all talk about different things. You can introduce them to the classroom and different age levels as well. So many different so so, as we know, the purpose of today's webinar help you guys understand what financial literacy is and how you can integrate it into the classroom. So, we basically learned what financial literacy was, how to include it, examples and topics, resources, and links. And so, the top three benefits to teaching students about financial literacy is, is, our alarm <laughs> is helps them learn how to set goals for themselves in the future, school, job, saving for a house, etc. Helps them avoid easy money problems they may encounter in the future, like student debt, credit debt, etc. 
and helps them know where to find the resources and where to go if they need any further information. So in the end, guys, financial literacy, it just makes perfect sense. Get it? Sense? It does, it does. <laughs> Good one. Gotta end it on a pun, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all <laughs> and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Happy birthday. Thanks. Happy birthday, guys.